Hi all, and welcome to our lab, Learning at Bloomsbury, where our aim is to be able to provide football for all, regardless of the background, ability or financial situation of the players. We want to encourage young people to pursue their full potential in sport and out of sport. As part of a passionate group of football coaches, we know that there are those involved in the game who are always looking for ways to further their knowledge and understand the game. And this notion gave birth to Lab, a free coach education platform that brings specialists and other like-minded professionals into the spotlight to share their experiences and ways that you may be able to apply this to your own coaching and programs. Hi guys, my name's Nick Barham. I'm the Academy Manager at Bloomsbury Football, the home of LAB. If you want to reach out and help to support LAB, you can do by emailing us at learning at bloomsburyfootball.com. As we go into today's topic, helping me today is Josh Arnold, someone I work with every single day, a master in the game and brings a lot of knowledge and experience to our LAB. Josh, I'm excited for today. What about you? Yeah, I'm really excited to speak to Sky again in sort of an official format. Um, it's been great chatting with her in the lead up to this. I've already learned so much in terms of sort of engaging parents and the trust elements. And yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of good takeaways. So yeah, really excited. Fantastic. So Sky, over to you. Can't wait to jump in. Excellent. Thanks. I so appreciate you all having me here. It's like um, Josh sort of alluded to, it's been great to chat with you in the build up to this and just see and learn more about the great work that you all are doing um, with your program. So really excited to be here. Um, obviously, this is information just about your lab program. I know you give a, gave a little quick intro about it, but I love the fact that you all are being so intentional with this extra education and learning and also pushing it out sort of collaboratively to people outside of your club structure, which is so important and is sort of foundational in the work that I'm doing when it comes to collaboration and partnering. And we'll actually dive into that a little bit today as we're talking about um, some of the topics that we'll be bringing up today. So just a little bit of backstory on me and soccer parenting and maybe a little bit of the why behind I, my starting soccer parenting. Um, so I grew up playing, uh, I was a youth national team player. Uh, I was a collegiate All-American. I played professionally. Um, I've been a longtime coach as well. I, I started coaching even in high school, which would have been about like 10th grade or so here in the States. Um, I'm a goalkeeper and did goalkeeper training on the side. Um, and I've always been an active coach. I have my USSFB license. I'm a coach educator for US soccer and doing their grassroots courses. I work for United Soccer Coaches, another large organization here doing their goalkeeping instruction. So coaching education and coaching coaching has always really been so deep in the work that in, in just me as a person as well and I do consider myself to be a coach absolutely I currently have a, a young U10 team which brings me much joy and lots of inspiration for my writing and the interactions that I talk about with parents as well um, and then I have two children as well and as my kids started coming up in the game I started to just be so acutely aware of the challenges that existed in the coach parent relationship and with that in mind, of course, I'd always been aware of this as a coach. I mean, we're, we're very aware of the challenges of the coach-parent relationship, but being on the other side of it as a parent uh, really, really put me in a position where I decided that I actually wanted to try to tackle and improve and solve these issues that we have in the coach-parent relationship. And so that's the work that I've been on for the last eight or so years. And I'm so happy to say that, you know, the, the positive feedback we're getting, the traction that we're having, the, at the beginning, everyone thought I was crazy and had no idea why I would try to attempt to solve this and interact with parents more, like who wants to do that? And now it's gotten to the point where people are curious or asking me for more. Of course, I'm here presenting. Um, and so people, people want and are starting to see the value of parent engagement and, um, and what those special relationships and how those relationships can improve the youth structures. So I'm really happy to see just the sort of change um, and involvement and the progress that we're making and the, the lives that are being better and the kids that are inspired just because of the idea that we're engaging parents now. Um, our vision at Soccer Parenting is to make you soccer better. And that's exactly why I started down this 
this path. I care so much about this game. It's given me so much. And so while a lot of this conversation today is of course related to just sports parenting in general across all sport, um, my focus has always been on soccer because I, I care so much about the game and I just truly want to make youth soccer better. Um, the mission at Soccer Parenting is to inspire players by empowering parents. And I want to pause and just explain that. So for the parents listening, I want you to understand the power that you have to make sure that your child feels inspired by the footballing experience. And for the coaches who are out there, I want you to realize that those collaborative relationships with parents are essential. And that kind of builds into my belief statement. So at Soccer Parenting, we have four belief statements. And the first you read here is that we believe that you soccer parents will be difference makers when it comes to improving the game. So for so long, we pushed parents away and not given them a voice and encouraged them to just stay over there. But we actually need to start embracing the fact that the parents are actually going to be part of the um, a significant part of the solutions that we're seeking in football for our children. So we believe when parents seek information about how to best support their player, that great things will happen. And we do a lot of education work at Soccer Parenting. So there's a lot of terms about engaging parents and working with them. Um, but I think it's also essential that parents listening here understand that there are very important things that you need to learn from an education standpoint um, about how to best support your child. And we'll dive into a few of those here today. We believe that more collaborative environment between coach, parent, club, and player is in the best interest of player development. Absolutely, and that will be a lot of what we're talking about today. And we also believe that a strong and supportive community of level-headed and like-minded parents and coaches will inspire players. And the level-headed and like-minded is really, really, really key here. Because as we're diving into thinking about our current ecosystem in football and youth soccer, um, across across the world and these same patterns follow, follow everywhere and these conversations that I have with youth leaders all across the world. Crazy soccer parents are ruining it for everyone. And I use this term crazy soccer parents a lot at soccer parenting. And I know that all of you sitting there just shook your head and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And um, what we've done, unfortunately, in our youth structures is we've given parents way too much power. Um, the crazy parents, way too much power. And we've given them way too much attention and we've let them lead too often. And so the work that we're doing at Soccer Parenting is sort of a rallying cry for the level-headed parents, the level-headed coaches to come together. Because the last thing that we wanna be perceived as a level-headed, but maybe sometimes stressed parent, the last thing that we wanna be perceived as is a crazy parent. And of course, I'm coaching for a long time. I've had crazy parents on my teams in the past. And yes, they have ruined it for me in many cases. And so as coaches, we've been burned by crazy soccer parents. And so we've oftentimes just, you know, it's taken a while to recover from that. And we've sort of pushed parents away as we've tried to rethink those relationships. So crazy parents have ruined it for everyone. We hear this a lot. Of course, there's been too much emphasis on winning and short-term results not enough focus on the big picture of what a sporting experience really brings to our children. So, you know, it's something that we need to acknowledge. That's obviously an issue we hear about a lot. Unfortunately, players are afraid to make mistakes. There's so many showcases and they feel like they're on this journey to this next level and this next level. And there's a lot of confusion about that. And unfortunately, a result of that has been that players are afraid that, that to, to try, to experiment, to learn. <laughs> Um, and instead, um, you know, are being maybe potentially overcoached and aren't able to make the mistakes in part, as part of their learning journey. Coaches are often not aligned with the mission and vision of, their, of the organizations that they're working for. So, you know, the organization might be saying that we're about player development and life lessons, and yet there's too much of a focus on winning or early player selection, whatever that might be. There's not enough emphasis on how children learn and develop. You know, this is not a straight path. Um, children acquiring skill and learning and growing, whether it be with it, within the game or in their mental side of the game, none of that happens on a straight line. And so we don't have enough emphasis on that. And that's where parents need to come in and learn about how children learn, how people develop. And obviously needs to be increasing conversations about that within our coaching cultures as well. 
parents are not involved in the right ways. We're going to dive into parent engagement today. So we're going to give you, I'm going to give you all these clear guidelines on ways to be involved in the right ways. Um, again, parents are fearful of being perceived as a crazy parent and they're receiving a lot of mixed messages. There's an unfortunate lack of collaboration between coaches and parents. And what this lack of collaboration doing is it's holding back development. So, I mean, who knows their child better than anyone than the, than the parent. And so if the parent and coach can have very clear boundaries around the type of relationship they have and the type of conversation they have, but if there can be some collaboration amongst them, that's when the great things will happen. One of my favorite stories about that is a couple of years ago with one of the teams I was coaching, um, one of the girls on my team was very, very shy. Like for her to make eye contact with me, even three months into me coaching her and working with her every week, it was still a challenge for her. And obviously this is something that her parents are wanting her to work through and that sports provides a great opportunity, opportunity for her to work through the shyness and in her interactions with adults and her interactions with her teammates. And so one day her mom called me and she said, if she comes anywhere near you and is just barely making eye contact with you, can you please engage with her? Because we've been working all day. She has some questions from after the game the other day. She didn't understand something you said. And so I've been working with her on trying to create a conversation with you about that at training day. So anytime she's near you, try to pull this out of her, please. And I love that. That to me is an awesome collaboration between parents and coaches. That isn't really exactly even specifically a stress about the game, but it's about the life lessons that we're seeking our children learn. Um, and so just an idea or a thought, and I love that story in terms of collaboration between parents. And I love that the mom trusted me enough to call and have that conversation. That's where we need to be getting with it within our youth structures. And then we'll talk briefly today about sense of community, but we really need to continue to focus on sense of community. It needs more emphasis. It needs development within our club. And that's why I love so much the work that you all are doing at Bloomsbury. And it seems like you're really working on establishing this sense of community within the club itself, which you know, we know what all the research says about how important that is to players and families and coaches remaining inspired. So we have a good snapshot of our current ecosystem and we can, you know, there's also many amazingly wonderful things that are happening as well. But when we're looking at these challenges and opportunities for growth that we're faced with here, we kind of can ask the question, like, where do we start? How do we solve these things? And when I started down this journey so many years ago, it seemed like a very overwhelming uh, question. Like, how are we going to change an entire culture that is very systemic? And it's uh, often related to like societal culture that we're feeling right now, like how our children are being raised in society right now. So where do we start? How do we solve these issues? And um, there is a very clear place that we start and it's with trust. So we need to dive into establishing trust in the coach-parent relationship, establishing trust in the coach-coach relationships, in the referee coaches, and the club leaders and coaches, and the parents and other parents, the parents and referees. Like trust within this ecosystem is foundational to the positive change that we're seeking. And there's a ton of research about trust. Um, that we can look at from Fortune 500 companies in the United States, and there have been many studies on these organizations, and what happens when an organization um, has trust-filled relationships. This, these are some of the things that result in these organizations. There is increased value. There is accelerated growth. Let's think about what this means in soccer. Increased value. You're positively impacting the lives of more children. You're bringing value and richness uh, to more families and coaches are happier when there is more of that happening. There's accelerated growth, whether that means actual growth in the organization of growing numbers, whether that means growth in terms of growth of the individual player, um, enhanced innovation. So an example of that is I feel like the organization where I'm working, the, the club where I'm coaching has really good quality trust. So when I go to the parents on the team and I say, hey, this weekend, we're going to actually, instead of playing in league format, the other team at our club that we've lost to the last two times we played them because they're a better team than us and they're in their same division. Instead of playing them a third time this season, which is what was happening last year with COVID because we had such limited games and matches that we were able to have, 
I said to the parents, um, we're going to scrimmage them. We're going to split the teams. We're going to make them as even as we can. And we're going to get out and have a very focused and a game like with a referee, but it's going to be mixing the two teams together. All the parents were so happy with that. And if we didn't have this trust filled organization and we didn't have this trust with an organization, calling that out or suggesting that there might have been a little bit of pushback. Side note, the game ended, I think, five to four. It was an awesome match. Um, and so it was great to be able to, you know, have that innovation instead of, I think, in the past, they had beat us like seven, nothing, six to one. So it just was a great match anyway. When we have trust in organizations, there's improved collaboration, whether that be locally, like you're seeing even here with pushing out the lab and collaborating with organizations and other sporting organizations right in the area, um, inviting them to participate, that's fantastic. Stronger partnering, better execution, heightened loyalty. So all of these things happen when we have trust. And if you think about the issues that we were talking about within the ecosystem and the challenges that we have, this solves a lot of them. And so the question then becomes is, how do we do it? How, how do we establish trust? And there's actually real clarity around that amongst, um, amongst research as far as that's concerned as well. So I'm gonna give you a couple of ideas here. We can chat about these more. If you have any questions about them, pop them into the question box, absolutely. But you know, how do we establish trust? The first thing that we have to do amongst coaches and parents or clubs and coaches or clubs and parents, well, all, of, all of us, is that we have to listen first. We have to actually be curious. We have to under, want to understand the other person's point of view. So you're, um, uh, you're, you're a coach and a parent is coming to you with some stress they're feeling about their child, which you welcome that kind of conversation. If your child's not feeling inspired, if, they're, if you're feeling a lot of stress, please come talk to you. That parent comes to you and instead of looking at them saying, oh my gosh, they're so out of control. You are listening first. You're really trying to understand where they're coming from. We're clarifying expectations. This is so essential to sense of community building. It's having appropriate boundaries, clarifying expectations so that parents have clarity on, uh, so that clubs have clarity on what parents should be able to expect for the coaches, so that coaches have clarity on what is expected of the parents. Um, that is essential in establishing boundaries so that we can really facilitate a positive relationship. We need to keep our commitments to one another. Um, in the United States, we do a lot of player feedback and clubs oftentimes will say, you know, during the trial process, we'll give you feedback midway through the season and we'll give you feedback in the spring. So we start in September. So like around the holiday times, we'll have a feedback period. And just before tryouts happen in the next spring, we'll do feedback as well. I get so many emails from parents in like January that say, the club said that we'd have they'd give us feedback in December and they haven't done it yet. Do you think it's okay for me to ask for it? And I'm like, heck yes, it is okay. But at the same time, it's curious to me that the parents even asking that, like they they don't have um, they don't have that confidence that you know if somebody says they're going to do something that they should be able to it, it, they should keep their commitment. So that's foundational and just an example of how we can um, keep our commitments to one another between coaches and parents and clubs. We need to deliver results. Um, I guess this comes down to what you what you believe to be true when it comes to um, what you think your role is. Um, you know, I think of my job as a coach as positively impacting the lives of children. So that's delivering results. If I'm positively impacting their life, then that's delivering results. That will establish trust if that's where the focus is. Um, extend trust. You know, um, I start a lot of the education that I do with parents and that I do with coaches is what do you believe to be true about youth soccer coaches? And what do you believe to be true about youth soccer parents? Like we need to get that and process that and then extend trust to one another. We need to confront reality. A lot of times these are conversations that we need to have about children and their performance or children and where they're placed on a team or where we believe that they'll be best suited. Um, it's really important to be able to have those very real conversations with parents. It actually helps establish trust instead of ignoring stressful conversations that we might have. And likewise, for parents, you know, reaching out and being able to talk to the coach about, you know, what's really right in front of them, um, whether it might be the way their child, your, your child is feeling or whether it might be the way your child um, is, what the, the messages that you're hearing from them when they're coming back home, like bringing those forth to the coach is essential. 
demonstrating respect to one another. Um, this can be demonstrating respect. I often say to coaches, you know, the first name of all the parents on the teams that you coach, like how awesome would that be to get out of your car before you're walking out to the fields on Saturday and be able to say, hey, John, good morning and know the dad name of the parent. And, and likewise, it's really important that we as parents really demonstrate respect to the coaches, understanding their time commitments to their family and the unique amount of commitment that coaches are making into the youth game and how that time frame is often not conducive to families. And so trying to talk to a coach after a match about something or not scheduling a time and just assuming that they'll, they'll be available after training um, is not necessarily always the best process. And it's not a demonstration of respect for their time. And then finally, we can establish trust by getting better, whether that be co coaches um, working on furthering your education and diving in um, and, uh, you know, becoming a better coach yourself or a better inner, better in your relationship building with parents and your players and parents that's diving in and, you know, diving into the education that I'll be talking about here about where uh, and key areas that you need to be learning more about in order to best support your child to make sure that they're inspired. So that's just the concept of getting better. So I wanna dive in and kind of shift a little bit from what's foundational to us improving this ecosystem of establishing trust. So once we have this sort of these trust-filled relationships or we're seeking them and we're being very intentional about trying to establish trust-filled relationships, which is a very, uh, unfortunately, oftentimes sort of a novel concept in youth football, like how do we have these trust-filled relationships? And then I want to sort of shift here to parent engagement. And this is where I always start, is what does parent engagement mean to you? And if you're a coach, I actually want you to just kind of take a moment and think about it. If you're a parent, I want you to take a moment and think about it. Um, and maybe even jot down a thought or two about this topic and what it means to you. The reason I start there is because there's also a lot of confusion about parent engagement and what that means. We already talked a little bit about the mixed messages that parents are receiving when it comes to parent engagement. You know, there is so many like memes about the helicopter parents or, you know, the lawnmower parents who are just removing obstacles for their children and how this really isn't helping when it comes to grit and resiliency and determination and um, maximizing a child's ability to learn and grow and develop. So we have all of that stress as parents are ready. Um, but then we're also, you know, I'm saying be more engaged. And then other people are saying care less. You care too much about your child's uh, you know, sporting experience, you need to care less. And then somebody else the next day is saying care more. Like it's just trying to find this balance is hard. We obviously already talked about like the crazy soccer parent and how we live in fear of being um, that. And then there are also, um, something is important to note is that there are also coaches that have different philosophies. Some coaches are more collaborative, some aren't yet. And so, you know, being out, having to shift between different coaches and different um, seasons or years can also sometimes be a challenge. But the bottom line is that parents are receiving a lot of mixed messages when it comes to engagement. And so I want to sort of draw, have some clarity around that. And um, to start with the idea that you do need to be engaged in the right ways. So much research about parent engagement in schools and what happens in a school when there are positive, powerful, um, well-implemented parent engagement programs at school. This is what happens in schools. The children will perform better. They'll have higher test scores. Uh, children will complete their homework. When effective parent engagement programs are put in place, the, the students at the school have stronger self-belief. They do not drop out of school. They stay in school longer. The parents are empathetic and the teachers are satisfied. So we know that this is what happens when schools have um, successful parent engagement programs put in place. And yes, let's imagine that for clubs. So the kids would play better. They'll have more inspiration. They'll train on their own, stronger self-belief, keep playing. The parents will be empathetic and the coaches will be satisfied. If I could go to every football organization and say, I have a way that all of these things will happen. You can read the list again. Everyone would say, tell me what to do. And the answer is parent engagement. 
And so parent engagement solves so much of what we're talking about. So this is the why behind it. You kind of might be saying, well, what is parent engagement? And it's actually much simpler. It's just a matter of putting processes in place, following through with them within the club organization and rethinking the relationships, working to establish this trust. So when I talk to coaches and I say to them, why do you coach? Coaches will say things, and if you're a coach, you can kind of think about this, because I want to help kids fall in love with this game that I care so much about. Why do you coach? Because I want to teach life lessons to kids, because I want to help them develop skills and, um, and be more confident in the game. So um, then I ask coaches, what makes the season successful? And coaches will respond when the kids register for the next season and want to keep playing. When we do have, you know, some positive culture within the team, when kids are learning, when there's been some obvious growth, like all of those things make a season successful. And then when I go to parents and I say, parents, why do you have your children play football? And the parents will say things like the life lessons and the teamwork and the collaboration and the um, solidarity with teammates and all of those types of things, the leadership. Um, so all of those things in those life lessons. And also because I want them to get better at, at football. And I ask parents, what makes the season successful? And the parents will say similar things and such like, um, when my child is happy and satisfied, when they wanna keep, when they wanna go and play again for another season. And so I think when we're talking about parent engagement, it's really easy to say, is it possible that we can bring these things together? And to me, this is what parent engagement is, is that when the coaches and the parents get aligned about the why and the what, why they're doing this and what makes it successful. And if we can keep our focus on that alignment and where we are when we're together, then we will have successful parent engagement programs. And what the focus is, is on players that are inspired. So if that can be our together focus, and that's where we come together as coaches and parents, that essentially is parent engagement. Parent engagement is coaches, clubs, and parents working together to ensure players are inspired. We all have our own ways of doing that, and the coaches, the massive preparation that you have to do for training, your feedback to players, your evaluation of matches, and how you're going to implement new thoughts in terms of the team growing, you're working on your interpersonal relationships with the team, the, the players, maybe any other coaches that you work with within the club. And then obviously, you know, the parents have a lot to do as well. And we're going to dive into what the role of the parent is. But this is parent engagement very simply. It's parents, coaches, and clubs working together to ensure that players are inspired. So how? We know what a lot of the how is when it comes to the clubs. So I'm just gonna push this out right away. So from a club and from a coach perspective, this is parent engagement. It's club-wide communications, whether that be in the form of social messages, newsletters, emails, whatever your club decides. It's whatever that club-wide communication structure that you have in place. Coach communication, whether that be uh, preseason meetings that, they, that you all may have, whatever your club has in place, it, it varies. Some coaches are extremely communicative. Um, you would think that in the work that I'm doing with the teams that I coach, that I would be like a lot of coach communication. I actually set the boundaries right, right from the beginning with my teams that they will get very few emails from me. Um, we have something called Team Snap here in the States. And I don't know if you guys have that in the UK, which is just a communication platform for us to be able to communicate with parents in the club. I can send out quick little chat messages and emails very easily, but I say from the very beginning, I'm not going to do that a lot. Um, I do have a pre-game meeting with my team parents. So while the players are in their final phase of warm-up, I walk over to the sidelines. We have a quick one or two minute little, um, I call it a pre-game huddle where I explain what to look for. So that's my primary interaction. Um, from a club coach perspective, parent engagement is also, we reference sort of team meetings that you may have. And also the power of these really brief interactions, the 
as I mentioned before, getting out of the car. Good morning, John. How are things going? Like that brief interaction that you have with a parent is very, very important when it comes to, from the coach club perspective, what parent engagement means. Um, individual player meetings maybe you have at clubs or your organizations, um, and then transformational conversations, which of course are probably, I hope, your favorite if you're a coach is, is having those transformational conversations, whether it be supporting a parent through their potential stress or having that transformational moment with the player um, in terms of helping them get from A to B, whatever that may be. So we get the clarity around the club. And a lot of times when we think about parent engagement, that's what we think about. Um, but parents, it's really, really important that you think about parent engagement from your point of view. So not from the club's point of view, how they engage with you, but actually how you engage with the game. And so obviously there's meetings, emails, transportation, you need to stay on track as a parent and get to the meetings, read the emails, get get your child to training and to the matches on time and be there to pick them up on time. Um, but you also are there to support your child in the goal setting process, whatever that might be um, based on your family and maybe how your family dynamics work around goal setting and um, how, how that works for your child. And even if they're a young child, you know, to have goals that they might want to have maybe about the friendships that they want to make, or if they're older and have are on more of a high performance pathway, supporting them in those goals. Um, attentive silence mode. Uh, this is something that we talk a lot about at Soccer Parenting. Um, we believe that supportive communication is fantastic and should happen as much as your child wants it to happen. Um, distracting communication, talking to your child while they're performing, telling them to shoot, to score, who to pass to, distracting communication has to end. Hostile communication, of course, has to end. But we talk about this concept of attentive silence mode in two key ways. So the first is that matches like my daughter, Callie, she does not like to hear me play or hear me talk. She wants me to just be quiet during her match. Even if I'm like telling the goalkeeper that my daughter is not telling the goalkeeper, Hannah, that she made a great save, like just Callie says, hearing your voice just distracts me and I have to then refocus. So at Callie's matches, I sit there in attentive silence mode. Um, I'm there, I'm paying attention, I'm not on my phone, I'm not off, you know, doing something else. I'm there and I'm supporting her, but I'm doing that silent. This, my son, though, likes to hear my voice. He likes that supportive communication. Good job, keep going. Not the distracting, the supportive. So it's important that we find that balance as parents. The second key thing for attentive silence mode is in important conversations, maybe even those transformational conversations that the coaches are having with your child. Or uh, I think that there's times where parents need to be a witness to that. Uh, I know as a parent that if the coach talks to my 17 year old son and gives him some key things, that message is not going to get home to me in the way that it was delivered to my son. He's just not going to remember it. And that message isn't. So I think that there's some important conversations that happen where these are great opportunities to teach your child how to interact with an adult, to ask follow-up questions, to listen attentively, um, or maybe that they have an agenda for a conversation with a coach and to support them in creating the questions and then to be there in attentive silence mode, not stepping in, but just observing. So then later you can get back in the car with your child and say, hey, that was great. Or maybe you could have done better there, or you could have, you could have, um, you know, asked another question here, like that is like amazing learning that will help our children when they graduate into maybe playing at university or having relationships with professors at university or in a job environment. So that's what football brings us. So attentive silence mode is a key thing we talk about quite a bit at soccer parenting. Another key thing for parents to consider from a parent engagement standpoint is moments of ignition. Like for us in the States, this is maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a lot more important and that it's just been in the last two or three years that the EPL was on easy for us to get all the time, all the matches on NBC. Um, so uh, it used to be hard to find games to put on and to have those moments of ignition. So with parents, I'd say these are things also a lot of the parents in the States didn't even grow up around the games. So this is new to them as well. So Finding a team for your child to support might not be like a lineage type thing that's happening in your family or getting out to a match or finding a player to follow, um, buying a jersey, those types of things um, we talk about in the States a lot as moments of ignition. And I'm sure that there are some relatable things, obviously, for you all as well. Um, go outside and play with your child. Just go out and have some fun with them. Find a 
rebound wall to fun, come up with some random rebound game to play with them. Or, you know, we, we having those times where we're interacting with our children are extremely special. And there are, they are important to developing a stronger connection around sport with our child and framing that appropriately. Um, obviously a parent's most important decision is the playing environment for their child. So that is a way that parents need to be extremely engaged. And then finally, you know, we talked about this sort of this concept of education. So at Soccer Parenting, there's six key areas that we educate around that I just want to dive into really quickly. So the first is about the body. So this would be things like how growth affects performance or when is important to layer in um, more physical development. Like when, do, when should kids start lifting is a question that I get a lot. So, you know, educating yourself about the body. Educating yourself about the mind, mental performance, how to deal with stress, how to support your child if they're feeling anxious, how to, as a parent, support your child if they just made a really big mistake in the game. Um, those types of things we need to, more learning about as parents on how and best practices and what we should do in these situations. So we need to dive in and seek education about the mental side of the game, about the physical side of the game as well. Um, and then the game itself. So whether this be about laws of the game or just the nuances of the game, understanding the offsides law, those the offside law, those types of things. But also it really is maybe even diving into how kids learn and how the game is taught and best practices for that. So really important to understand things like skill acquisition and, and different things like that. Um, we also need education around the coach parent relationship, how to have difficult conversations, how to, um, it, what to expect in terms of trust, like we've been talking about today, how to establish those boundaries, what those boundaries should be. Um, the next level, so what pathway your child is on, if they veer on a more of a high performance pathway, how do you best support your child there? So whatever that next level is, maybe it's going from more of a grassroots environment to a different environment, um, you know, how you can support your child through whatever that next level might be. And then finally, parenting. So parents need to dive into some best practices and some learning and getting some support and education around parenting when it comes to specifically parenting an athlete. Typical things we think about with that are like car ride home, um, how to support them through what we have here is a very stressful tryout process. Um, those types of things is essential that parents really educate yourself. So from a parent perspective, this is what parent engagement means. And I think, again, we focus a lot of from the club's perspective. So I hope the parents that are listening feel a little sense of like, oh, I have some key things that I need to do in order to support my child to make sure that they are inspired from the game. And finally, I just wanted to close with this concept of sense of community and how essential us having a strong sense of community within our club structures or team stru structures is so important. And the clubs have a role in that, the parents have a role in creating a sense of community for our children, whether that be um, you know, connecting with other parents, whether that be you know, being intentional about having ways for the players to be able to interact outside of the soccer experience or the football experience. So the sense of community, and there's a lot of research around sense of community theory, is something that sort of we go from trust and then we go to parent engagement and best practices for that. And then we're gonna land at sense of community. And once we can really feel like we're back to having these strong sense of community where we're focused on the right thing and our mission and our vision is aligned with what's happening on the pitch, then we're going to really have this much stronger experience for our children in which there'll be even more inspiration and families will be supported as well, which is essential. And again, that's why I'm so excited to be here to present here with you because you know, I get the sense that, um, you know, you're really working on establishing the sense of community within your club and within the footballing structure that you have right there in London uh, and just see the essentialness of that. So I th thought it was important that I just sort of end with a little concept of sense of community. So I'll wrap it up here. Um, you all can track me down on Twitter at Soccer Parenting um, or Sky Eddie Bruce kind of confusing to spell all of that. So soccer parenting is probably the easiest on Twitter or um, you can track me down on LinkedIn as well. So I look forward to connecting with you and answering any other questions that you might have. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and pop back over to Nick and Josh. what do you think guys? Yeah. <clears throat> I'd love to jump in with a question straight away. It's firstly, brilliant presentation. Really, really enjoyed that once again. Um, so have you got any examples of expectations of parents at your club with your under 10 team that like any specific ones and also from a parent's perspective when you're watching their coach 
what do you then expect? So I guess both sides of the expectation that you that you mentioned. Mm. Yeah, so um, so part of expectation is around boundaries. So I think maybe so let's start with boundaries and then maybe we can build into expectations. So like from a boundary standpoint, like what's acceptable in the coach parent relationship kind of dives into what your expectations should be. So, you know, I think it's important that coaches and parents are aligned around this idea that if your child is getting in the car after some after training repeatedly and not feeling inspired that should open their door to a really important conversation between a coach and a parent to try to figure that out and get to the bottom of that and uh, maybe the coach is being too hard on the kid and they think that the kid likes that but they're masking it and in training they're being tough and they're like working harder and they seem to be responding positively to that but then they're getting in the car and they're breaking down like as a coach wouldn't you want to know that so that you can maybe back off the kid a little bit or build them up in a different way so you know those types of boundaries are important um in that you know if your child's not feeling inspired there should be a conversation between the coach and the parent um non-confrontational just with the focus on the child being inspired um, we also need to open the door as coaches and parents to conversations about like if a parent is being stressed, is feeling like a lot of stress, whether that be about the child's performance or, you know, the position they're playing, whatever it be, like if you're feeling really stressed, like talk to the coach, let's have a conversation about it. Um, and that would, if you ask for an example, you know, like last year I had a new team and I had this one girl playing up top all the time. And that's where I thought she had always played. And um, my role, what, what I do with the team is I have them in key positions for the first part of the season. And then they go to a secondary position. And then in the spring, we flip it. So they get eventually, but I had her at the very beginning playing what I thought was her like favorite position. And to have her dad come to me and say, she's really struggling. <laughs> like she's never played here before. And can you give her some more guidance? I was like, I thought this is where she always played. So, you know, that type of interaction is really important. And once I was able to adjust, I still played her there because that was part of where I wanted, but I was giving her more guidance and information and instruction and coaching her and presenting these ideas to her a little bit differently. So I think that that's an important example of like those boundaries that need to exist and then the interactions that can result. Your second question was kind of like from the coach's perspective. Yeah, so I guess, like from your side of it mm -hmm. as a parent watching on yeah. like looking at another coach what do you then expect to see from them yeah I expect them to be coaching in whatever coaching style is theirs we're not going to all have coaches that are the same but my expectation as should I'm imagining your expectation as a club is that it be an inspiring environment that's all I can really care about. I can't can't dive into the tactics. I can't dive into practice design. I can have opinions about like what I think is the best type of practice design. But then my job as a parent is to find the right environment for my child where that club also has alignment around that. But then the coaching, the things that happen on the pitch, that's the coach's role. That is not my role. And so my expectation is that my child will be inspired. Maybe not every day because it's not easy every day, but they're going to want to keep playing in the then that the football experience is going to be good for them. Brilliant. That's great. And we had a question come in here and I think we've touched on it um, when we spoke about trust. Um, but the question reads, how can parents and coaches align a similar vision for a player's individual needs? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the challenge of coaching right there, huh? <laughs> like, how do we support holistically each child in front of us on the field and so it's a challenge right for us as coach to think about that but how much easier is that if we're getting feedback from the parents like tell me about your kid like what 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 would you hope to have them get out of this season uh from a from a not soccer we're not talking soccer life lesson standpoint how can i layer those types of things into my training so if i know that you know, the, the child is, uh, you know, the parent says, I really want them to have better relationships with the players. Right now, they only know one player on the team. And so then you think about that in your practice design and how you're putting players in groups together and maybe some leadership role you give this player within this environment to give them more of a voice within the team. So, um, I mean, I think that, that it just, it takes us being extremely intentional. Um, and it's, 
it's inviting parents into that process because parents have such insight for us. If we, if we trust them and if we don't just assume that they're going to start talking about how their player is going to be this great, blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean, that's the assumption we always make as coaches that, that parents will sidetrack us. But actually, if we, if we frame the conversations correctly and the questions that we have for parents correctly, we're going to get a lot of really great insight that can bring us together and have this alignment when it comes to a vision of supporting the player and when it comes to their individual needs. That's brilliant. Another one from me, where do you see the responsibility in terms of dealing with failure between parent and coaches? So like failure is inevitable. It can be a really good thing, obviously building character. Um, where do you see that sort of sits in the balance? So I imagine you might say that there's responsibility for both, but yeah, I'd be yeah. interested to hear your thoughts. Well, I mean, that's where the learning really happens, right? <laughs> and it's so hard. It's so hard to be a parent, watch a child fail. I mean, um, you know, just not make the team they want to make, not get the playing time that they really, really think that they deserve, um, or to, you know, not have things work perfectly, have an injury, all of those types of things. It's so hard as a parent to help your child get through those things. Yet at the same time, um, that's like I said, where the learning happens. And so I think the best things to do in these situations are to just, when we are talking about talking straight was one of the things that I mentioned um, and confront reality is another thing I mentioned when it came down to establishing trust. I mean, that's where these real conversations need to happen between coaches and between players. My team last season, little U10 team, didn't win a single game. We got put in the wrong, not the wrong division. We got put in a division that was a real challenge for us. And it was largely because of COVID. Uh, I coach in the largest club in Richmond, or one of the, we have two kind of large clubs, but the largest club with this youth program. We have four U10 girls teams. And I'm in the second team down. And we got put in the division with a top team, which in the Richmond market put us with all the other top teams in this area. So we're playing against the best teams at all the other clubs. And because our club is so large, we had two teams in there. We lost every single match. And that was hard, right? That could have been much harder. Um, or was it hard? It actually didn't have to be. Like at the end of every match, we had to go out of our way to find the positives and to see the improvement and catch them being good and catch the, the positive things happening. And I think all the parents at the end of the season would say, wow, this wasn't what we intended going into this, but what a great season this was because our girls kept battling and kept fighting and they got so much better, you know, over the season, like we could see this improvement happening. And so, um, you know, grit, determination, resiliency, all of these are things are foundational to why as parents, we want our children to play sport. They're also foundational to, I think what keeps us coming back as youth coaches, like being able to teach these life lessons to kids, um, you know, that, that is what often I find is most inspirational to coaches as well. So um, as hard as those experiences are to go through, they're essential and we need to be aligned when we're going through them. You know, the coach who after the match, you lose it for nothing. And you look across the field, the parents are walking to you and you're like, oh, like, you know, you're already upset and the parents are coming to you and you make these assumptions that they're upset too, like into a line in those moments of, wow, that was really hard, but this is what happened that was positive And this is what we can do to, these are my expectations for the players moving forward, so. I think that's a great answer. answer. Yeah, but... really, really good. Just, uh, <laughs> I know we've got sort of examples of that in, in our place. And that's sometimes you don't see the progress until you then play someone potentially of a closer level and you realise then how much you've improved through yeah. losing. That happened at the end of the season. Thankfully, we played in a tournament at the end of the season that we we're much better aligned with. And we lost in the, the last game of the tournament to a team that actually wasn't our division of... And we, we tied them and lost in the last moment. They scored a goal, uh, you know, but, but exactly right. It was very affirming. So that season, the, the end of that season was a, a real positive. And as a coach, if I had been in that situation, I didn't have a tournament. Maybe I would have sought a friendly against a club locally that I knew that we could have be less stressed and my players could have more time to think and could really demonstrate some of the things that they learned so that we could end it with a positive like that. 
Yeah, I think that's a, a great situation you've alluded to there. And it ties in perfectly with this ne next question from our attendees. So the question reads, what if parents measure you only on results? And I want to tag this question with asking, how would you as the coach in that situation approach that relationship to be able to highlight other ways of measuring that relationship and success for you as the coach and what is success for that season? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's essential that we start out from the very beginning with as coaches with our interactions with our team parent with the parents on our team from the very beginning highlighting what's important to us and that we be aligned around that so my first um my first conversation with parents is always um sorry it looks okay my first conversation with parents when i have a new team is always tell me about your child and i can't wait to be able to be, impact their life and this is what we're hoping to accomplish from like a life skill standpoint. And this is how we're going to impact the players. And this is what we're hoping they'll learn on the pitch. And so, um, you know, from the very beginning, we need to frame it around that. Um, I mean, to answer that question, I'll go just to uh, kind of reflect on the season that I had when we lost a rematch. Like you have to get real. Like if the parents are valuing you only on the results, then you have to ask why are they? And then that's where we really need to seek and establish trust. Now, there might be a parent or two that just can't get over it. And maybe those are legit crazy soccer parents and we have to start give, stop giving them such power. And instead, as coaches, we need to focus on like the level-headed parents and bring the majority of the parents together. And one time, you know, if you have that really loud voice that detracts from the progress that you're potentially making, that is focused too much on the results, that's extreme, huge distraction. And you really have to, you have to work hard to get past it. I find the best ways to do that is to have like straight out team meetings where you're not calling out a parent specifically, but you're really calling out uh, and, and talking straight about, I'm feeling a lot of pressure. I feel like there's a way too much focus on the results. I'm doing a exceptional job with your children and this is why. This is how they're growing. This is what our focus is on. And parents, this is what I need from you and really bringing them back in. And it's okay to lead and have those types of conversations in a you know, non-confrontational way, but to just say, you know, reality check for you as parents as well. And um, I was just counseling and working with a coach last week who was really coming to me struggling. Like, like I've coached for a long time. This is the worst situation I've ever had with parents. They're putting way too much pressure on their children. And I feel like nothing I do is enough. And, you know, for me to even say to the coach, they're being wrong, you're doing a great job. That was very affirming to the coach because it's so hard and we do have so much stress. So we need to seek support as coaches when we're in that environment. And we need to be in strong club cultures that are really focusing on the development instead of the winning. And if you do have that one parent or two, you need to have an extremely direct conversation with them. And if if you need to build those skills to be able to do that. As coaches, a lot of times we don't have those skills, which is why I do a lot of coach education around things like emotional intelligence coaching, how to have difficult conversations with parents. Like that is stuff that you need guidance on. And if you don't feel like you're equipped with those skills, then find a colleague, find a coaching director, find somebody from the club that can support you in having that conversation very directly with a parent you feel that is focusing too much on results. But go into the conversation listening first. You seem very stressed about this environment. You, it feels to me that you really care a lot about winning. Can you tell me why that's so important to you? Like that's where we need to start those conversations. Fantastic. I'm full of long-winded long answers to questions, sorry. <laughs> I think a lot of detail is so key though because we're dealing with situations where there is never one right answer. Mm -hmm. So we're covering so many bases and at the heart of all those solutions is the player and making sure that we're doing the right thing and, and to quote you, to inspire that player. Mm -hmm. So Sky, I wanna say a big thank you from us for being on our lab series. Um, as we alluded to at the start, if anyone wants to get in touch, feel free to email us on learning at bloomsburyfootball.com. Sky, thank you again for your time and looking forward to catching up soon. Thanks, thank you, guys. Sky, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Guy. Thanks, Josh. Cheers. Bye.